Welcome to the Your Lifestyle is Your Medicine podcast, where we do deep dives into topics of mind, body, and spirit. Through these conversations, you'll hear practical advice and effective strategies to improve your health and ultimately add health span to your lifespan. I'm Ed Padgett. I'm an osteopath and exercise physiologist with a special interest in longevity. Today, my guest is Nathan Riley. He's the tattooed heretic of natural birth, death, and parenting. He's trained as a standard medical MD who specializes in obstetrics. But after being at over a thousand births, he became disillusioned with the standard medical care offered in the US. So now he promotes and advocates for midwifery, and he still attends births himself. He has a C-section rate of less than 5%, which when compared with the average in the US of about 32%, it shows that he's doing something right. Now, he's not all about entries, but he's also into exits as well. So he has a subspecialty in palliative care, which is helping people at the end of their lives. In today's episode, Nathan and I take a deep dive into natural birthing and what's wrong with the current system and the history of how we got there. We also look at how lifestyle medicine can help fertility as well as the birthing process and explore the role of men in birth. Coming away from today's episode, you're going to have some great ideas and tools to help you set yourself up for a natural, healthy conception, healthy birth, and a healthy postpartum as well. If you haven't heard of Nathan, I suggest you check out his Instagram, which is Nathan Riley OBGYN. It's such a wealth of information on natural birthing and palliative care. And just going through his Instagram can really educate you on what his mission really is. So without further ado, let's get to it. Nathan, welcome to the show. It's my pleasure, Edward. Thank you. Cool. I'm so excited to have you here. And I, I want to kick things off with the little teaser that I put in the intro there of what happened when you graduated as an MD, you're working in the standard medical care. What happened in your experience to, for you to take this path that you're on? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm suspecting a, a, a UK accent from you, right. Ed. Is that yeah. right? Yeah, yeah from the UK. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so I've got a lot of friends, midwives, doctors, colleagues that work in the UK. The systems, mm -hmm. you know, no, not that much different. You know, it used mm -hmm. to be quite different where you call it midwife. You know, the television yep. show. Yeah. Um, even as recently, probably as a hundred years, similar to the US and Canada and a lot of the developed world, that um, it used to be that you had your baby at home unless you really needed a hospital because that was so expensive and it was. We didn't know much about germs and all of that. Mm -hmm. You know, people in the hospital weren't necessarily doing better and midwives really, really knew how to do this. But my path was like most, most doctors, you know, you go through all the school, you take a lot of tests, you're rewarded with more and more education throughout that path. And then you would find yourself on the other end, surrounded by people who did the same thing. And, uh, you know, a lot of people ask, why did you go into OBGYN care? Well, there are two reasons were that I was so mystified by the birth experience, having seen one in med school as the first birth mm -hmm. I'd have been to. And as a man, I didn't have any kids. Like most of us don't talk about birth. It's no. kind of, and in, if you look at my Instagram feed now, it's all babies emerging from vulvas, right? So, <laughs> so um, I was mystified by that, but I also, you know, I, I also had quite a bit of athletic experience, a lot of nutritional sort of research, even in my college days. And um, I figured, well, gosh, maybe I'll be able to get into the family household because the gatekeepers are often women. Mm -hmm. and And even if they're not like, the, you know, we're not talking breadwinner, you know, housewife thing. I, what I mean is that the emotional space and sort of the flow of most households is is driven by the the the, the feminine. Mm -hmm. And so I figured, well, I'm going to be meeting with them. They're going to want to clean up their lifestyle. They're going to want to move a little bit better and all this. And and uh, the reality was, on the one hand, I didn't have a lot of time to counsel on lifestyle. You know, it was very fast, quick visits. There was a British medical journal that looked in primary care practices and found that primary care docs, OBGYNs included, only spent, only gave their clients about 22 seconds to speak before they would jump in and start kind of taking over. Wow. So there wasn't a lot of, there wasn't a lot of conversation there. And I, I'm a chatty guy, as mm -hmm. I'm sure you know. So the, the other issue was that I was trained just like every other doctor. You intervene every step of the way through the childbirth process, and I wasn't seeing great outcomes. You know, there's certainly, we, we have a lot to, you know, even to, uh, you know, aspire to, even looking at the UK data mm -hmm. or Canada data, like the US is, is falling, has fallen to the bottom of the list of developed countries, um, rich nations, especially with how much we spend on healthcare. We fall into the bottom of the, of the bucket. And I was like, well, 
if this isn't working, then then what are we doing? Why are we still doing this? And I started realizing people were getting upset being woken up in the middle of the night for a hand in their vagina while they're in labor. And C-section rates now are one third, you know, of all yeah. babies through the abdomen. One third of babies are being, uh, pregnancies are being induced, meaning we're getting the labor going before stuff starts happening naturally. Mm -hmm. And so I wasn't seeing great outcomes. I was being trained to do certain things that I didn't see as helpful. And I became very discouraged, very disillusioned. And it wasn't until the COVID era where I kind of, I mean, I was i was shoved out of the system. I was fired twice during COVID for COVID-related things. And it was kind of a universal nudge for me to, to try to figure out how I was going to do this in a different way. So I've been doing it uh, my way from the very beginning, but really now I don't, I don't have insurance companies telling me what I can and can't do because they won't pay for it. Mm -hmm. I don't have people who, uh, continue to outsource their power to the cult of medicine. I have people that really want to stand in their, their autonomy and really dial in their lifestyle in order to optimize their, their pregnancy and their, their, you know, their, their health for their, mm. the rest of their life. So, um, <clears throat> that's probably the shortest version of that story I've ever told, right. but I hope that okay. summarizes it a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, well, I want to get into you know what happened. So, for for example, I am I'm the youngest of three, and my middle sister was born at home whilst my father was in the driveway looking for the midwife. So mm -hmm. she had she didn't arrive in time. He walked back in, and then my sister was. And you know, when I moved to Canada with my wife, she's British as well. We went uh -huh. to a birthing center with midwives. And uh, it didn't actually work out for us to do the whole birth there. We ended up in hospital, but with no C-section. But it was it. We had to push for the midwives, and the waiting sure. list for us to get on was, you know, I think as soon as we knew we were pregnant, we applied and we managed to get in. But what's happened in the U.S. from that more traditional midwife model to this very sort of intervention-centric model? Well, yeah, you know, a lot of people introduce me as like, I'm a midwife, and I wouldn't use that term, because mm -hmm. that would be an insult to the the lineage of traditional midwifery. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking the African diaspora, the South American diaspora, most indigenous peoples had a rich history of women caring for women. Now, mm -hmm. whether or not that's true, whether or not women actually gave birth, you know, free birth, as we call it now, where you don't have any attendance, and there was a woman just standing guard to make sure that that process wasn't disturbed doesn't really matter women had always had a part in childbirth back to ancient Sumer, earliest written human history. So the lineage of, you know, or, or let's say the, I don't want to use the word ancestral, but let's, let's just use that because I think people can, can yeah. understand that the ancestral wisdom that was passed down through families by generation that really continues to embody what, what I would call traditional midwifery. That's not my term. That is the term that a lot of midwives that practice in the home very much out of the system in the U.S. and 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 abroad, um, they practice this tradition of midwifery. And so I don't say I'm a midwife because I don't I I don't have the privilege of calling myself mm -hmm. a midwife. In some regards, I kind of wonder had I gone to midwifery school, Definitely would I be start. accepted as a male yeah. midwife? I you yeah. know I I don't know. But the uh, you know to 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 to, uh, to sort of illustrate just how different it is you know we <clears throat> in the in the hospital system we've got all these life saving things if you need an emergency c section which is not 30% of births as we seem to believe right. through our data for the past several decades if you need an emergency c section great i'm really good with surgical steel mm -hmm. that shouldn't be that should be the exception not the rule yeah. and it is starting to become the rule so Contrast that with when I was in residency, I actually sought out the opportunity to go to home births with midwives and a specific home birth doctor named Dr. Stu Fishbein, who is quite on the border of retiring now. He's been mm. just pushing his pushing back against the system now for four decades. Mm -hmm. um, but I went to a birth with them and, and I came home and I was like inspired again. It was like, wow, that's what birth can be like. Mm. And uh, then I, of course, did, as you mentioned, did my fellowship. I was doing a lot of hospice and end of life care and didn't really know how I was going to make it work. And eventually I did step away from the system. I didn't get fired from my OBGYN position. I actually decided to leave that because the long hours on call, doing unnecessary procedures, mm -hmm. all of the stuff, I just, it just wasn't me. So I was like, I got to figure this out on my own. And instead of starting a home birth practice, I actually started supporting local midwives as their collaborating physician because so few OBGYNs are willing to acknowledge yeah. the expertise through this ancestral wisdom and apprenticeship that midwives go through. So that's a big part of what I do now is if I want to, if I want to really honor midwifery, let me step out of the way and let them do the thing 
that they've done so well for so long, mm -hmm. you know, regardless of what the system says they can or can't do. So, so that's where I'm at now. And I do attend home births as well, but it's usually for people that are completely desperate. They do not have a midwife based on their state's, you know, licensing restrictions and requirements or whatever, mm -hmm. but those are far and few between. I always encourage people go to a midwife. They can do it way better as mm -hmm. much as I want to pretend I'm not a midwife. So <laughs> But what happened though in the medical system in the U.S. to get to the thir the um, thirty three percent or the, the the one third of C sections, whereas other countries have lower C section rates? Right, right, yeah. So I, I'm realizing that was your actual original question. <laughs> <laughs> I brought um, you back to it. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. So his, you know, so again, historically, people used to have babies at home. Yeah. We had turn of the century, twentieth uh, century. You know, right around the Industrial Revolution. We've got a whole bunch of very rich people, you know, running the steel industry, running the banking industry. We have the Rockefeller family, which is probably one of the richest families that has ever lived, who um, with their Carnegies wanted to invest a quite a bit of money into industry. And they chose healthcare as their as their target. And what they did is hired a guy named Abraham Flexner. Flexner, who, Flexner, Flexner Report. I'm familiar Flexner with that. Flexner Report. Yeah, yeah. You're very familiar because the type of work you do as an osteopath and some of the craniosacral yeah. therapies, a lot of those practices fell by the wayside yeah. because those schools did not model the German style medical education that had just recently been adopted in the United States, the yeah. first school being you know, the famous Johns Hopkins. Mm -hmm. So as soon as that, we're talking in current day money, probably hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars mm -hmm. were invested into this healthcare reform movement. And any school that was not going to follow those the the boundaries of German style medical education, they were not financed. Some of them still lived, but the homeopathic schools, the osteopathic programs, a lot yeah. of these traditional therapies that had been a long, around for even longer. Chinese mm -hmm. medicine is a great example. Ayurveda, longer, way longer than Western medicine. They fell by the wayside due to lack of funding, you know, because you just could not compete with these ivory tower medical institutions popping up with the influence of Rockefeller medicine. So. Mm -hmm. That was in 1910. As soon as births started moving into the hospitals, as there, there's a long comp competitive period where the Western doctors, the, these influential ruling elites really were trying to take all of the business away from all of the, the traditional or folk or alternative healers, the midwives maintained care over pregnant women as okay. they had all, throughout history. It wasn't until they started moving births into hospitals because middle and upper class women could afford these fancy new institutions that we saw an actual increase in infant and maternal mortality. And that was because we hadn't really fully explored germ theory. So yeah. then germ theory came around and showed everybody, hey, look at how great this is. You don't have to die from purpural sepsis, which is just like an infection in the uterus that can kill you very quickly without antibiotics. Mm -hmm. So then there was this rapid influx to the hospitals um, further, you know, be, beyond what we saw. And we actually saw a drop in maternal and neonatal mortality. And that kind of sealed the fate. Now, right. fast forward, why do we have so many C-sections in the United States? Mm -hmm. That is the specific question. Yeah. Part of it is that when we intervene more, we lead to catastrophic things down the road. And then we have to save them from the interventions that we imposed unnecessarily in the first place. But the other big thing, and th this was really laid out nicely in a um, Ohio University uh PhD's book. It was called um, American Caesarian, I think, or Caesarian, Caesarian Section in American History or something like that. She really talks at, at great length around this universal continuous fetal heart rate monitoring, which was introduced in the 60s, 70s and became nearly universal by the Stress, 90s. Stressful. So Very stressful. stressful. You're yeah. watching this little thing tick. And yeah. as soon as the heart rate drops, everybody rushes in. It yeah. really, really created a, a, a dilemma. And if you put 100, even today, 100 OBGYNs into a room together, we're talking, I'm just looking at the United States, but you could apply this anywhere. Mm -hmm. That's That software was never validated, meaning if you got 100 in, in, in a room, they yeah. would disagree left and right as to what was an okay sh tracing versus not so okay tracing. Right. And as we've gotten better at C-section, we just have a lower and lower threshold for just rushing to the operating room. So in some states, it's as high as 50%. There's certain counties in the United States, so specifically in the South, but in the law of averages, we've got California and some other Colorado, Utah, where the C-section rate is very low. But gosh, even if it was the who thinks we should be below 15%, my rate has always been low, less than 5%. And it's because I learned from midwives how to get the hell out of the way. And when you do that and you leave it undisturbed and you're not asking questions and scaring them with these different technologies that are unvalidated, birth just tends to unfold in a much more beautiful, easy way, which makes my job easier, which makes their recovery easier, mm -hmm. which means we don't have to go to the hospital and 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 fork up 10K for a C-section, you know? Mm -hmm. So 
Um, so I hope that answers your question. I think it's a really, really important one though. It does. It does. And there's a couple of things that you mentioned there with, with that uh, fetal heart rate monitor, when we, when we moved from home to the hospital during my, my wife's birth, um, or my, my, my daughter's birth, the, every time it dropped, the, the, um, attending physician came in, but we bought the, uh, actually two midwives with us because we were lucky that a shift changed. And so the, right first, the first lady was like, no, I'm not leaving you guys. And the other one was like, well, it's my shifts. So we're both here. They actually disconnected cool. it. They disconnected it and they shut the door on the doctor and said, you know what? You don't need to come in. We're both here. We're fine. And luckily they had a relationship with that particular doctor. The doctor was like, okay, call me if you need me. And, um, yeah, but the end of it was that, uh, we didn't have that thing, um, messing with my wife's mind and sort of messing with my mind as well. It was great. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Anyway, people don't need to hear that story. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually think it's well, so, so if, if I may summarize yeah. sort of that experience, there's actually a really good reason for us to not be scaring people throughout labor. Yes. I think it's good to have monitoring systems, but if this isn't super well validated, it may not be necessary. A lot of midwives use intermittent auscultation where they just listen once yes. in a while during contractions to see what's happening. And that has been shown to be just as as uh, as useful, uh, efficacious in detecting abnormal, you know, stressful babies. Um, I shouldn't say abnormal, but babies that are having a hard time, um, and without uh, leading to as many C sections mm. as continuous monitoring. So this is a pretty darn simple way to see how less intervention actually can and can oftentimes lead to to better outcomes the, the continuous heart rate monitoring was initially introduced to drop cerebral palsy rates but those rates have not dropped at all right the only thing that changed is this, uh, is a skyrocketing of c-sections around the world yeah how interesting there's uh, a midwife called Michel Odont in uh, France Are yeah you familiar with him he, well, I he may he may call himself a midwife, but he's a general surgeon. Like oh. that guy has had some seriously rigorous surgical training right. before he even stepped into the birth space. Talking about that, uh, he's he's a mentor of mine. I've had oh. him on my podcast. So, oh, excellent! Uh, well, at osteopathy school, brilliant. we were told to to look him up and um, use him as a sort of a model for birthing, or use his his theories and read his books. Sure. And it, yeah. it turns out that a friend of mine actually had him as you know, at her, at his, at her home birth. And I was like, well, you know, what was he like? You know, what did he do? Wow. That's and, amazing. And he, so he's in London and he literally came to the home as her third child came to the home and he sat in the corner and read the paper. <laughs> she had an 11 pound baby that was born. She said in the amniotic sack without him wow. even standing up. On call. And and I was like, well, what did he do? He did nothing. And that's, that is his magic that he did nothing. Yeah. yeah. You know, I've got a, uh, I've got a, a tab here on my, um, on my browser open. I'm listening to a, a lecture by Stuart Fishbein, who was my mentor, right. the one that I went to, uh, to, um, for home births with. And one of the first exercises he taught me was like, I'm going to teach you the art of doing nothing. Wow. No, that doesn't mean that Michel Odant was doing nothing. Right. He was actively holding back, restraining from intervening in a process that if he was a big part of it can actually disrupt it. And one of Michelle's books, which you would love is called the functions of the orgasms. And it actually really elucidates the, the role of oxytocin, which governs over orgasm. It governs over, um, it causes a quivering of the uterus, bringing sperm up towards the fallopian tubes. When sperm is introduced through orgasm, ejaculation, I should say, mm -hmm. causes that whole body orgasm. It causes, um, so, it, so it's involved in conception. It's involved, of course, in in event, eventually ejecting the baby from the pelvis, and it's responsible for this milk letdown reflex. But if you activate the catecholamines by touching somebody inappropriately, by speaking to them poorly, by scaring them in whatever way, whether it it's off. bright lights or whatever, you actually yeah, you actually yeah. suppress the impact of the love hormone, this chemical, this beautiful chemical from the brain. And of course, we use synthetic oxytocin, yeah. but it's not the love hormone. It is a a janky version that only acts at the uterus and causes, by the way, far more painful contractions than natural oxytocin does because it's it's infused at a continuous rate rate, <clears throat> excuse me, versus a pulsatile rate. So uh, Michelle has has probably had as much influence on me as anybody I've ever directly worked with in my life. Mm. That guy, I don't know where he was getting his insights, but uh, even late in his career, he was just pumping out language yeah. that has served so many people, um, birth workers and women alike. Fascinating. 
So you mentioned like the orgasm there, and there's this movement that I see a little bit on the social media about orgasmic births. Is that something like, is that a thing? And, And if it is, tell me more about it. Well, you know, you and I will never experience a birth, whether it's painful, orgasmic, pleasurable, whatever. But I will say my wife, uh, we had a home birth in our set for our second, which was about a two hour total, not even two hours of labor. Um, we were doing a breath work style of breath work called effigy, whereby the it like the portal opened, the baby came out of sleep and the portal closed. And my wife did use the word ecstatic, right? pleasurable. Those are the types of words she was using. But she doesn't, what I think is important to remember is when a person says orgasmic birth, we're not talking about like, wow, that felt like a really great massage or, Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. like that was great intercourse or man, my vibrator really, you know, I I really had a good morning with Mm -hmm. my vibrator. I don't think that when I've explored this with women, I don't think necessarily they're talking about pleasure in the same way. It's actually above that. It's actually, it's like a direct audience with the divine Mm -hmm. whenever you're having a baby. And there is some ecstasy that comes with that, especially with that flood of oxytocin. You can feel high for days. Mm-hmm. You know, you you probably remember that. Um, and, and on, on the other hand, when a person has a even an unmedicated birth in the hospital, sometimes you don't ever achieve that because there's so much disruption and distraction. So usually, women who are are having orgasmic births, ecstatic births, they're almost ubiquitously people who had a birth either at home or without an attendant right. at all, maybe in the woods. And they just really embodied the whole experience. Yeah. That connection with the divine. I mean, it is a divine act. You're bringing life into the world. Yeah. That's yeah. fascinating. Yeah. I remember reading uh, Ina May's book and she did, she <laughs> talked about this experiment she used to do with um, the male, the male doctors she would be standing there in a room with the, with the fluorescent lights above the head. And there would be like, the, this is an empty room, but this is where the lady's going to give birth. And she'd be like, okay, uh, can you just pee in this cup? And do, do you remember this story? Anyway, <laughs> and, and whoever was there, yeah. like some student would be like, no. He goes, yeah, you're right. It's not easy to pee or open a sphincter in a room when it's light and there's lots yeah. of people watching. So yeah. how do you expect the women to open a sphincter? And I thought that was such a uh, such a sort of a little lesson to learn about lowering the lights, getting the candles out, and making it a sacred uh, a sacred event. Yeah, yeah, that's I mean, you know, so that in that book that I cited, you know, Doctor O'Don really explores that, you know, and a lot of people would argue you can't really have an undisturbed birth in the hospital. There are too many policies and procedures mm-hmm. that are interrupting that that experience. And if you if you're able to watch a person from afar giving birth. They are not on their backs. Generally, they're not even standing. Sometimes they're actually, oftentimes they're actually kneeling and almost in a prayer pose. Mm. And I think it's because it deactivates your 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 senses. You know, you aren't looking, you aren't really hearing anything. You're going deep, deeply inward, and that allows oxytocin to really ramp itself up mm. in order to honor the unfolding of the birth, as opposed to forcing you on your back and telling you to push, push, push. Most women just push when they feel the urge. Yeah. But if you're yelling at them, if there's beeping, if there's you know um, bright lights and all of that, I would have a hard time being that vulnerable and, and and relaxing into the or surrendering maybe to the experience of giving birth. And I've saw that my wife do that in our bedroom on our bed with our second baby mm-hmm. in the middle of this breath work. Like she was grounded. She started tapping me because we were doing the breathing. And I turn around and this baby just emerges. Like it wasn't even like she was pushing. Wow. I don't know what she was <laughs> feeling. I can't tell her story. But that's far, like, you know, another thing that Michelle O'Don taught me was we have studied for far too long when the bad thing happens, when that person's birth didn't go well. What if we invested our time in studying what happened with my wife or women who who reported an orgasmic birth? That's where maybe we can start to learn what works versus what Mm-hmm. doesn't work <laughs> mm-hmm. but isn't that that's that's one of the problems with western medicine is like andrew wilde talks about that in his book spontaneous healing that no one investigates the people who get better because yeah then, i love that they're, love they're not that they're it. not interested yeah we're not there yeah. inter- they are interesting but you know you're a, a, a regular md and you're seeing you know 40 50 60 people a day like one gets better great move on you know yeah Right. Yeah. It's it's almost like when people tell you that story about their vacation, they tell you about that crazy, horrible thing right. that happened. We're supposed to leading with like, oh my God, we had the best yeah. champagne when we were in France or something like that. They talk about that person, that weird 
thing. Like we just love those negative yeah. anecdotes. It is, isn't it? We, we doctors are, are not immune to that, no. I think. I think it's human nature as well, slightly, that we share the negative. So to forewarn our sort of tri- yeah. tribe and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, in, so in birth, during the birthing, um, you know, during birth, what role does a father or a husband or, or a man have? Well, this is a great, the way I frame it for the men that come into my practice, you know, when people hire me to support them remotely through pregnancy, which I do, I just had a couple who had twins um, in Australia and um, I was just supporting them remotely throughout the whole pregnancy, helping them understand what the ultrasound means. Why are they recommending this thing? Do we need to intervene in this way? And um, when I, when I have these couples come in, I spend as much time, if not more time with the men than the women, because I don't think us men have a lot of modeling. You know, you're a little bit older than me. I don't know who I would have turned to had I, you know, not been an OB-GYN. I don't even know if I would have known what I don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and now I've learned that uh, we we not only need modeling, which is actually a big part of my course in the, the Born Free Method, there's a whole unit just for the dads, where we talk about, first and foremost, sacred polarities. You've got the masculine and the feminine. And we've always thought the masculine is the football player and the feminine is the, you know, fairy in the garden. But when a woman is giving birth, there is an immense power coming through. Mm-hmm. And we as men, as 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 uh, who can really acknowledge the, the the masculinity. I mean, I am like very masculine. It's just in my nature. But what is the role of the masculine in our everyday life? Usually, it's like, hey, I'm going to go fix the problem or lift the heavy thing mm-hmm. or defend my tribe. There's no role for the the, the within that 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 perspective of the masculine. There's no role for a man in pregnancy mm-hmm. in childbirth. But I want to encourage people listening to really honor what is the role of the masculine. Those things all, you know, are what the media tells you. But the role of the masculine in the most succinct way that I can describe it is if you look at a river running through, you know, some mountains, that river would just be a puddle without the sides of the mountain. Mm-hmm. So the mountain is pre- is creating a container, creating, you know, counter pressure on that body of water in order for that water to flow. And that water is going to erode the sides of the mountain here and there. But it's not the job of the mountain to direct the river. The river is going to go where the river goes. The river in this analogy is the feminine. Mm. The mountain in this analogy is the masculine. So the mountain is holding space, holding the container, holding the ship upright while the the feminine does her her thing, and which is a maelstrom of activity. Mm. And um, in in the childbirth process alone, sometimes the greatest exercise for us men is to really honor that this this feminine energy in front of you is going to whip and whirl and thrash about. And it are, is our job to not come to the, the situation with the solution, but to just let them rage. Yeah. A woman roar when she's pushing her baby out. Let her roar. Hold space for her to roar. Uh, you know, encourage her to roar. This is the job of the masculine. Mm-hmm. So in practical terms, I think a lot of couples, they kind of fall out of intimacy in pregnancy. I actually think this is the time when it's important to connect as deeply as you possibly can, because you've probably never seen one another in such a, an acutely stressful sort of scenario. Like birth is orgasmic and pleasurable, but it's still stressful. Like nothing worth doing isn't a little bit stressful. And birth is definitely one of the biggest stressors that these young women, generally young women are going through. So as the man, what can you do? What you know? What language does she want you to say? How does she want to be touched? This is the exploration throughout. How can I serve the role of the mountain? Mm-hmm. And that can be nine and a half months of you know worth of work. It could be years of work before that, but we don't know what we don't know. So I try to get people started starting these exercises very very early on. I also really encourage people to consider when you go through birth, whether you're a man or a woman, you're going you are going to die, and a new person emerges. You've been through this. You know, when you emerge as a father, you are a different, you're archetypically going to show up in the world differently. You're now a dad. Yeah. Doesn't mean it's the only way to get to manhood, but it is a fast track towards being an adult, uh, you know, becoming a father. Mm-hmm. So that's really, you know, a, a little sort of snapshot, I think, of of what men can do in helping to prepare for this. Because um, one little final thing I'll say is that I didn't realize just what my role even was, was a, as a father. There's this little screaming baby and I'm holding her and rocking her and changing her diaper and trying to burp her. And she's just screaming. And it took me about six months into our first daughter's life, who, by the way, came in the hospital. So we've had both experiences. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember, and I don't have milk. I've done all the things. 
And I would just want to like abandon her and like leave her with, with my wife yeah. and just walk away. like she, I, I, you, you figure this yeah. out. And what I realized was for the first time in my life, I was being expected to sit with somebody's pain without any judgment, mm -hmm. without any frustration, without any projection. And so there's a lot of shadow work that I could have done beforehand as well. Mm -hmm. I'm not feel, I'm feeling, I'm feeling not needed. I'm feeling inadequate. I'm feeling incompetent. Like bullshit. You're, you're their dad. Just bear witness. Yep. They want you to love them through their darkest times and their lightest times. Mm -hmm. And that's your role as a father. And many of us, we don't step up to the plate. You know, a lot of people turn to alcohol and they turn to, they get obsessed with the gym and they're finding as many reasons in the world to not be with their babies because they don't feel like they're useful. You guys are very useful. They need your, they need your masculine energy in their life. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. I do, I do remember the first time my wife left me with our, with our first, with our number one. And it was always like, scary. It, it's scary. I was like, okay, <laughs> I got the bottles. I, I, I'm, I'm all prepped because up until that point, when she was inconsolable, just put her on the boob and everything was fine. And that wasn't an option. And I, I also remember one of my mentors in the fit, in the sort of movement world, a guy called Gary Gray. He's a, he's a very lateral thinker. And he had this problem once and he tells a story. He's like, okay, what does my baby want? He wants a boob. And he's like, okay <laughs> and he put, a, he put his baby on his own on his own chest he said it worked his nipple. <laughs> his nipple, but it worked a treat and uh anyway yeah, but wow. it went through my i didn't do it but it went through my mind um so wow. you mentioned your first birthday was in hospital uh and you were uh, maybe didn't have the experience you had for your second birth what was that like for you when you were in the hospital with your knowledge um yeah yeah tell me about that great question um you know, a big exercise for me the first time, instead of working on the stuff that I could have been working on that I just described, mm -hmm. which I really dialed in for our second, they were only about 20 months apart, by the way. Wow. So it was very, very, and two, one was born right before COVID, one was in the middle of COVID. And um, the hospital experience was interesting because I was also a doctor at that hospital before I left. I had left just before uh, our baby was going to be born. Mm -hmm. I just didn't want to do it anymore in the hospital. Mm -hmm. So they all knew me. They knew that I was very hands-off. We had a great OBGYN read net um, shout out to her in Louisville, Kentucky, who was very much that person sitting in the corner, just waiting right. and being still and being patient and maybe reading something on her phone, you know, like she was just in the corner, didn't even know she was there. Um, but there was still, you know, it's hard to have that undisturbed experience there. They had a birth tub, but you're not allowed to give birth in the tub. So you're about mm -hmm. to start pushing. We need to get you out of the tub and get you on this uncomfortable bed. And I think all of that, this little, little tiny things individually don't seem like a big deal, but when you add them all up, it's like, man, especially after going through a home birth, I think my wife was like, that was like night and day, yeah. completely different experience. There was also a, you know, there's a practice of massaging the uterine fundus. That's the top of the uterus to help it contract down after birth. And you just do it through the, through the abdomen. And a nurse came in, it was like a brand new nurse. We had just given, you know, birth at 6am or so the new nurse comes on at seven and she's like, oh, well, you just had a baby. That's so great. I'm just going to give you a little belly rub. And she like swan dive, jabbed my yeah. wife's uterus and my wife grabbed her hand. Yeah. And like my wife is the most passive, like would not hurt anybody, mm. could not hurt anybody and said, do not do that to me again. Like it, it hurt, must have hurt her so badly. Yeah. And I think that was actually the most, um, that was probably the 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 most the, the the greatest sting that she received, but then I also heard from a nurse who left and was a postpartum nurse and followed me on Instagram or whatever, and she was like, "You know, I got to tell you, I remember you being in the hospital for a, your own birth, and it was so great. And I I was coming on shift, but you guys were just leaving, so I didn't get to meet you. I just remember people saying, I don't know why she told me this, but she was like, I just remember people saying things like, "Oh yeah, the non-vaxing doctor over there." Hmm. Cause we didn't do any vaccines and anything. And I, I felt like my feelings were kind of hurt. It was like, fuck you. <laughs> like, right. like there's this passive aggressive tone. Everybody's happy and everybody's chill. And then they go back to the nurse's station and talk shit on you. Um, yeah. So it, it was just another, I mean, I was never going back to the system anyways, but it was like, gosh, just to know what, I, I mean, I know that nurses talk poorly about patients. We saw that TikTok video that circulated not long ago where labor and delivery nurses in the U S were we're talking about how annoying their patients were and they all got fired. You know, like it's, we all know that right. that's a part of the toxic medical culture, but to be on the other side of that and, and having ignored it my whole life, it was just like, Oh, yeah. it just, just not a great place to have a baby. It doesn't, for doesn't, <laughs> doesn't sit well, does it? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. well, I'm currently in, in Nicaragua and a friend of mine just gave birth here and her experience was, uh, was, was, 
uh, almost the polar opposite of your second uh, birth. She went to hospital. She doesn't speak great Spanish. And she went with her mom who doesn't speak any Spanish. And she, she's going, through, yeah, she's very, very brave. Like, you know, they could, they could have gone back to Canada, but they didn't, they stayed. And um, it's a, it's a military birthing model. This is how I understand it. So they're very prescriptive. And, you know, if you don't hit certain milestones, so she ended up having a C-section, but prior to that, the, uh, the, the OBGYN was laughing at her, literally laughing at her saying, you can't handle the pain. You probably won't have any more children. And she understood enough, oh enough Spanish to know that, that she was being laughed at, ended up with a C-section. And then they separate the baby uh, by about two, two or three, uh, she said blocks, but I guess that's a ward in the hospital from where she's sleeping. And in order to feed, she had to get up, hold her scar and walk, feed, and then they wouldn't pick the baby up for her. They're like, no, you have to pick her up. We don't touch the babies. And she fed, put the baby back down and then walked back. And the other mothers, um, she was eating something because they didn't provide food either. So her mother went out and got food. And the other mothers that had just given birth were like, oh, don't eat rice because that will expand your stomach and potentially push on the scarf, push on the stitches from the inside. Lord. And to get out of there, she had to sort of, hit certain um the baby had to hit certain milestones and she had to have a certain milestone but she signed all these waivers to say look i don't care about that i just need to leave right now and so she got out but you know like how like not oh. not how can we change that it's a different country it's a different system um it, it will change hopefully over time but the contrast between what you're promoting and what happened to her is unbelievably huge yeah. And, you know, I, going back to your first question, um, a lot of that stuff, you know, a lot of the disdain I have for the system, I had to actually work through that in approaching a birth in the hospital because I still was programmed with the fear of something bad mm -hmm. happening as a doctor. So it was my work to get that fear out of the way to not, you know, impress upon my wife while she was going through this, that I was worried or whatever else. Um, and had we ended up with that type of situation, I don't know how that would have changed things for me. It may have made me even, you know, especially disdainful, right. or it may have made me grateful that we had the system. Um, the contrast, though, with how these births can go, uh, you know, I can't. It can't be emphasized enough that as we start intervening and doing more things, you know, we act like a C-section is just this easy thing. Mm -hmm. That was. Know, historically one of the more dangerous procedures mm. that we ever used to do and it's only now that we've do so many of them that we can do it so quickly and we make it we advertise it as like hey why go through all that hard work mm. try this new you know new option where we're going to cut a baby out of your belly which sounds dystopic it should sound yeah. dystopic but you know it's fortunately we have that technology i just um yeah when you get on the path of having a baby in the system where everybody is trained to utilize technologies and they've been convinced that these interventions are helpful and they're so grateful to be able to care for you. They're good. They're well-intentioned people, but you have to realize two things. One is that those interventions oftentimes lead to bigger problems. Mm -hmm. Inducing early, being on Pitocin for three days predisposes you to massive hemorrhage afterwards because your uterus is so tired of contracting that it can't do that contraction, that involution at the end wow. in order to, to cut the, the bleeding down. The other thing is that in our system, nobody ever is talking about the role of lifestyle in preventing virtually every one of the complications that contributes to mm. you know dead or sick mothers, dead or sick babies after birth. So you've got this like, yes, they're heroes. Yes, they can do these things, but they've also predisposed you to needing those heroic measures and- Nobody there gives a gives a damn about what you're eating, how you're moving or anything. And then when you show up, they make it sound like obviously you have these complications because that's inevitably what happens in childbirth. Mm. But it's not. My wife took very, very good care of herself. My clients, I don't even accept them as home birth clients if they haven't been eating organ meats and really nourishing themselves through sleep, through you know Tai Chi, Qi Gong. They've been doing some building muscle to keep their blood sugars better regulated, you know, drinking living water. You know, all of the basic stuff that I know you and I mm. hold so near and dear are you never even hear a whisper of that in the medical system, who also is telling you it's not safe to have a baby at home. Well, there's two types of people yeah. there's unhealthy people and there's healthy people. And the healthy people generally have no problems at all staying away from your knives and your monitors and your bright lights and beeping, mm -hmm. beeping machines. Yeah, interesting. So, well, let's, let's go down that path a little bit more. So, 
you know, the subtext of what you're saying there is if you are really looking for a birth without any interventions, you've got to prep yourself years, if months, if not years beforehand with lifestyle intervention. Is that, is that correct? Right. Ideally, I mean, ideally, you are um, starting out your conception journey. You know, we've got, it's a $4 billion industry mm-hmm. ad in the United States, assisted reproductive technology. So I won't go down the fertility path, but, uh, you know, as you can probably gather, the same interventions that help you get pregnant are those that keep you pregnant in, in a healthy way and have your, your dream birth. So starting, I like to get people started about 120 days before they conceive. So we can dial in their metabolic health, get some basic foundational movement patterns in order, um, work on sleep hygiene, you know, like, so we, we just start building up our lifestyle around the goal of having a baby. All of those interventions are, many of them cost zero dollars. It's just a matter of really prioritizing your health. If you're not able to get pregnant, it's a signal from your body. If you're 25 or 30, let's say, and you can't get pregnant, we can't just say you, you're you're too old. Like you should not be shuttled to the IVF clinic to spend 15k out of pocket before somebody has actually looked, you know, under all these other stones to make sure that you've tried everything. Mm-hmm. And only then should we be use, utilizing those technologies. So um, in pregnancy, those same foundational principles also reduce, especially exercise. Interestingly, reduce virtually every pregnancy complication that you could possibly name, including the likelihood of tearing in the vagina. If you're not nourished, if you're a smoker, if you're diabetic, the tissues just suck. They fall apart. They're hard to put back together. You get wound infections, your C-section scar separates. That's all just a part of basic nourishment. Mm. Um, And I know it sounds like I'm saying, like, and I'm speaking to people that have a ton of money. If you wanted to add one food to your pregnancy that's going to improve every outcome, Go and buy desiccated or fresh organ meats from your local butcher. Nobody in the Western world prizes those anyway. So it's the cheapest cut Mm -hmm, of meat. mm -hmm. For four bucks at our regenerative farm down the street, 20 minutes from here, it's a biodynamic regenerative farm, $4 for a pound of beef liver. Mm -hmm. That's probably the highest quality liver in the country, given how, you know, they're a small operation, they're healthy grass, healthy soil, healthy cows, and healthy people. If you just invested in that, dehydrated it, if you want to encapsulate, if you don't like the taste, that alone is probably the cheapest trip to the grocery store that anybody could ever boast. But it's these types of things that um, us doctors get, at least in the United States, we get maybe one hour of nutritional yep. education. Yes, we have the biochemistry and all that stuff, but applying that when you're being flooded with 99% of your material, time in medical school with pharmaceuticals and surgery, trying to apply lifestyle intervention, especially in a system that only gives you 22 set, you know, seven minutes maybe with each patient, it's not going to happen. It just isn't going to happen. So people find me and they're like, listen, we don't have a ton of money, but how can we dial in our health? It's it's easy. And you're going to have money left over because a lot of this stuff is not rocket science. Mm-hmm. It's really a matter of reimagining and reclaiming our power, Ed, yeah. over over our health, over this temple that is growing the baby. Yeah. And that that leads to so much less expenses and pain later when you find yourself being induced because the placenta is pooped out mm-hmm. or the baby's not growing well or your diabetes is out of control or your blood pressures are through the roof. That's all very preventable. I get a lot of, of, of negative you know, la- uh, backlash for that, but it doesn't mean it's not true. Yeah. You know, the, the truth hurts and it, and it oftentimes really sucks. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you're looking at people's labs like, as they're going into the uh, either conception or, or once they're once they're pregnant and potentially correcting things through these lifestyle interventions as well, is that right? Well, yeah, y- yes. Um, I also, you know, I've I've done training in functional medicine right. and Mark Hyman and all this stuff. You know, getting labs is great if you have a specific clinical question that those labs are going to answer. Okay. What functional medicine has become. Uh, and and really in the even in the conventional model is let's just get these labs because that's what we do. Mm. I like to have a very specific reason I'm getting the labs. Like if you are tired, Mm. we check your hemoglobin and hematocrit. If that's normal, we check your iron indices. If those are a little off, then we have to consider, are you getting enough copper, zinc, magnesium, Mm. you know, the cofactors, vitamin D is very important. Vitamin A is in vitamin E. I mean, vitamin K2, like you start stacking up all those vitamins. You could check each of those, or we can just add some, you know, some, some healthy lifestyle interventions and don't even worry about Mm. it. But I will say that most prenatal lab workups mm-hmm. do not include things like vitamin D or magnesium or um, 
the iron indices, mm. you know? So I do add those three labs to every one of my, my pregnancy panels. And the reason is because those are probably the best bang for my buck. Yeah. And the other labs are great. They're, they're useful, but I do know, we, we all know that, or could know, <laughs> and now you do know that magnesium, vitamin D, um, uh, a lot of the micronutrients, I won't get into the whole list, but you know, a couple of these really key nutrients that we know are cofactors for so many different yeah. processes that, that if we're just going to supplement anyways, yeah. I don't necessarily have to do the labs. You're going to be eating organ meats and bivalve shellfish and fermented cod liver oil and all those things regardless. So, um, so I don't just go by the lab mm -hmm. values unless there's actually a specific clinical question. Um, I think after we implement these foundational principles and there's still an issue. That's when I start to really get into my, my toolbox of like, Hmm, something wrong with the gut here. Is there something wrong with, you know, the adrenals over here, the thyroid, how's that working? We start kind of exploring mm -hmm. that, that after, after we've implemented the, you know, the building blocks. I love that. That's, and, that, and that's the way, I, the way I work as well. I'm not a, a doctor, so I can't go down those, those, uh, those paths, but you know, 80, 90% of intervention can be done through lifestyle changes. And then when it doesn't add up, then it's like, okay, now I need to call in the specialist. Um, but interestingly for myself, I've got quite into the lab work and, you know, I wear the whoop and I'm testing things. And my conclusion of doing this sort of monitoring for a year is that if you feel healthy, you probably are. And uh, if, you, if you're not, then you're not. And so I wanted to find like, oh, am I missing something? I'm 45 or something off. Nah, it's pretty much okay. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, do you need the labs? Yeah. But like you said, if there's something that's indicating you need labs, then yes. But if there's not, you're probably okay. Yeah. And, and you know, I, these devices are great. The whoop, the aura ring, like there's some really, really nice things out there. The Fitbit was like the first, you know, awesome. iteration. I, I think that they're a great tool, but they augment our actual sort of self-reflection as to how we're feeling. I have clients tell me all the time, like, well, how are you sleeping? Well, you know, my my uh, thing says here, I slept, I got an 80% sleep score, but they're telling me they're tired. Yeah. And I'm like, well, did you sleep well or not? Well, I mean, my my watch says it. It's like, okay, let's pause. The This device is not a replacement mm -hmm. for you actually tuning into what your body feels and what your body needs. How's your cognition? Are you foggy? Do you have to chug a whole pot of coffee in the morning? It's not a replacement for that. Mm -hmm. And so- so I I, I love I, I suspect you've been doing this long enough to 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 realize that these are tools and a lot of your clients really, really probably benefit from that. Like let's first start with just how you're feeling. Do you feel motivated to work out today? I don't care what your HRT monitor said. Are you feeling tired and and and, and unmotivated? Maybe not the best day to be mm. pushing it really hard at the CrossFit gym. You know, maybe today we do some restorative yoga, we do some qigong, we go on a walk in the on the beach or in the woods. And um, and so <clears throat> some of us, I guess it just takes us a long time to figure that out. I was totally geeked out on those devices yeah. at one point, but it, it, it's not a surrogate really for, for actually how are you feeling in the world? You know, when you wake up in the morning, no, you're right. And and there's a study showing that they put people into a sleep center and um, tweaked the amount of sleep they had. So they gave people five hours sleep, but they told them they had, oh. they had eight and they said, how'd you feel? They said, feel great. I had eight hours sleep. Then they gave people eight hours sleep and told them they had five. And then they said they felt really shitty. And the difference is, uh, so the, the point of the study was to say that if you are going off what your whoop is telling you, you like you said, you can augment your thought patterns around how you feel. Uh, it's yeah, I find it fascinating. For, and for me personally, yeah. uh, I'm going to stop wearing it because I've worn it for a year. I've kind of figured it out. But to work out why I felt tired in the mornings after doing what I thought was like, you know, healthy. So I can't do any kind of, I can't go for a run or play pickleball or anything like that in the afternoon. It messes with the way I feel the next day. No way. And, and oh, that's interesting. I can do it all in the morning. I can stack my mornings full of, um, you know, cardio, but I can do weights in the afternoon and wake up just fine. And then personally, again, just eating too late is, is one that just messes me right up. Um. And I would, I think journaling yeah. those, I think that experience, like really, really knowing your body mm. is what this whole thing is about. Yeah. Once you really understand, oh, I do better, you know, um, I, if, if I wake up and I don't feel well in the morning and I push myself, I will feel good until noon. And then I have a, a I just fall on my face. Right. So what I'll do is I'll just load up a bell or barbell or a kettlebell and just do a couple reps 
on each side, different movements, just getting the movement in. Mm -hmm. Sometimes no weights at all, but it's it's not a matter of getting my heart rate up. In fact, if I notice that my mouth is getting dry and I felt really, really tired during the workout, that's my cue that I'm going too hard. Right. So these like part of training, part of this whole journey is not for me is like, I don't want to be your coach forever. I want to teach you those principles that you can just take and use for the rest of your mm -hmm. life, whether you're you know, fertile, you're on your fertility journey, your postpartum, your menopausal. It's, uh, we, we've become so distracted by technology. I think that sometimes we forget that there's some very, very basic ways to think about your health. And that is that if you're not sleeping well, mm -hmm. rest. And, and we don't incentivize that for people. So wow. it's, uh, so you sound like you know your body very well, for sure. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely very interested in optimizing health and, and being, you know, I don't like the word biohacker, but being a bioharmonist, I think that's the totally. best way. I oh, like I love that. Can I steal that? Yeah, I stole it from someone. <laughs> I think it's, okay. it's bioharmonist. Bio yeah, I love that. That's yeah, a nice one. Um, okay, I want to just bring us back to the lifestyle um, interventions. And you mentioned that you don't necessarily work with people who don't eat organ meats. Now, is that a dig at the vegans and vegetarians? Or how did you come to that conclusion? <laughs> I used organ meats as a surrogate for people taking care of themselves. Okay. Uh, you know, you don't have to eat organ meats. My wife doesn't like eat, like eating them, so I encapsulate them for her. Right. Uh, so <laughs> since you were asking about veganism, I actually will turn people away if they're really vegan right. in pregnancy because their placentas just fall apart. Like a real vegan placenta is deficient in a lot of nutrients. And you can tell placentas are these big... Um, like lily pad shaped things that are, that are hard, like you can't pull them mm -hmm. apart. They are like a big, hard chunk of liver in, in some regards. And those cotyledons, these little chunks, I've had maybe a dozen vegan clients in my life. I say clients because you're not sick when you're, when you're right. pregnant. I don't have a better word for it. But even when I was in the hospital system, I remember the placenta falling apart. Mm -hmm. And then if there was a tear in the vagina, which there often was, if you're vegan, mm -hmm. it was because you don't have enough collagen, lysine, um, glycine, you know, all of these really important amino acids, the tissues themselves lacked integrity. Now I'm not telling people what to do or not to do. I'm just saying that I have seen enough bad things happen mm -hmm. for my vegan clients that I will, I don't attend, um, mm -hmm. births, uh, for vegan, for my vegan, vegan clients in the home. Um, I will, you know, it, since we're drawing, I'm drawing a line in the sand. I, I am willing to say that I don't think that full veganism is necessarily the best approach for pregnancy. Yeah. It's just, I just, it's from direct experience. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you're vegan, but you're also taking some, some, you know, liver capsules or eating some, some fatty mm -hmm. fish or something like that. You've just introduced something. Mm -hmm. There are just so many nutrients you can't get from the plant world. Vitamin K2 is a great example. You can get vitamin K, yeah. but we have a hard time converting it to vitamin K2. Mm -hmm. You know, so heme iron, I mean, all of that stuff, taurine and, and bivalve shellfish is, is critical in pregnancy. Um, L-arginine is, is largely got derived from, um, from animal products. So that's my, that's what my experience yeah. tells me. So I do, I do advise against true veganism, mm -hmm. like full blown veganism in pregnancy. And aren't there some traditional cultures that prize the organ meats and give them to couples who are trying to conceive? I, I think I read that somewhere, yeah. Western A price, I think it was. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a Western A price sort of motif. Yeah. yeah. Um bivalve shellfish was the other thing that I found. You know, the aphrodisiacs, the oysters. Yeah. Um, oysters and mussels, I give my fertility clients, I tell the men, I want you eating three cans of these per week. They go and get the crown prince variety on Amazon yeah, or yeah. something. Nice. And uh and it has selenium, molybdenum, zinc, zinc, magnesium, fatty acids, like it is yeah. loaded. And you need all of those nutrients for a lot of processes mm -hmm. that lead to not only healthy sperm production, but also strong swimming sperm. Mm -hmm. And Nowadays, since we're on the topic of fertility, we have seen fertility rates declining over the past couple of decades. If you look at men's semen analyses, we say it's normal. The range of normal is like as wide as 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 the street, you know, in front of our house. Right. Like normal now is like anybody who has any semen is considered or sperm within their semen is considered normal. I would love for people to remember that wow. yes, it's normal, but what if we doubled your sperm count? What if we doubled the motility, which is a reflected as a percentage of the the sperm that are swimming swimming strongly? That's obviously going to improve the likelihood mm -hmm. that they're going to meet this egg, you know. So, um, so yeah, I I I get people eating a lot of organ meats, um, 
if you're a true hunter, you you prize the organ meats mm -hmm. because it is so nutrient rich. And of course, if you're getting organ meats from sick cows on some feedlot somewhere, you don't want to eat those organ meats. Mm -hmm. Those are sick livers from sick cows. But if you have a local farm that you can get it from, it's one of the best bang for your buck nutritional um, sources, I think, on the planet. Yeah, no, I totally agree. So going back to the motility and the, and the sperm count. So maybe you can explain something to me. Sperm has millions of sorry, semen has million millions of sperm in. Uh, right. And why do you necessarily want more sperm? Isn't it the motility that you're looking for for them to to find the egg? Yeah, there's something really interesting that happens um, that I don't think we fully understand. We always just say it just needs one sperm yeah, or whatever. Exactly. But if you actually look, yeah, it, that that's what I've always thought. But then I've started opening more doors. And what happens when you take an egg, which by the way, is this big vacuolated cell that you can see with the human eye. Mm. It's the only human cell you can see with the human eye. It's tiny, but you can see it. You put that into a Petri dish, put it under a, a, a high power microscope, and you're looking now at an egg. When you introduce a bunch of sperm in there, the sperm rush the egg and they form a corona, this crown yeah. of sperm, the corona radiata around there. And the egg starts spinning counterclockwise. These strange mysteries wow. around conception that I, I have only recently started to explore. So what I've actually started to ponder is, is it really just one egg, one sperm, or is it that there is a critical mass of sperm that surround the egg and start to help it transmutate? And one of those sperms does trigger a zinc-mediated reaction. It's an explosion that allows the sperm to be engulfed. It's almost like the chosen one, right. right? They're maybe not actually competing with one another. Maybe they're all banging into the side of the egg simultaneously to create something, some response that then triggers the engulfed sperm or the sperm to be engulfed by the egg. It's a very puzzling thing. I don't think that we ever ask the question, like, what is life? Like, yeah. what is that moment? And, I, I, you know, this is not related to abortion and everything. It's really like, what the hell is happening there? Yeah. Why is the eggs rotating? Why does all of these sperm, we think that they're all competing, but maybe they're all cooperating. So the more that you have, the more likely you're going to be forming that corona radiata. Mm -hmm. Perhaps more likely you're going to see that that engulfing and, and creation mm -hmm. of the embryo. It's it's a conjecture, but I don't think we have better a better uh, sort of answer to that <laughs> as of yet. Oh, fascinating. And, and when we yeah. when we see that, like you know, I remember that Corona, but it, we're seeing it in two D. But does it happen all the way around the egg? Like they they cover the whole egg yeah. like a shell. Yeah, and then yeah. they coordinate their somehow it coordinates to start spinning. Yeah, yeah, and as far as I know, Ed, it's always counterclockwise. Isn't that so now, now counterclockwise is presumes that we're looking at a clock face, but yeah. under the microscope, yeah. it does appear to be rotating you yeah. this direction counterclockwise, which I find to be like, I love this yes, stuff. I just love like, counterclockwise yeah. is, is the, um, the pattern of the universe though. It's a, it, yeah. I mean, perhaps that's yeah. Yeah. The spirals always go counterclockwise. I think, I think I'm right in saying that the, the galaxy goes counterclockwise whatever maybe who knows oh man it's some... it's, you just opened up something in my brain there i gotta look into it. exactly <laughs> there's, there's a mystery right there that needs to be uh, yeah. looked into wow okay i, I want to just sh to shift topic slightly so we've gone to the lifestyle medicine with fertility and um now i want to bring that into postpartum there's this bonding that happens between the mother and the baby within that first well you know, I don't know how long it is, but hours, days, months. Can you tell us a little bit about how that's changed in healthcare uh, recently? Mm, there, there was a little piece of what you were saying that cut it out. Oh. Can you just repeat that one more yeah. time? It, it, it was like, I think a key piece. Okay. I was trying to put the pieces together. So, so um, okay, well, I'll reframe the question. So once upon a time, they would you you would have a baby and they would take the baby away, clean it, do all these tests to it, wrap it up, then bring it back and now and as i'm understanding it correctly they try to get the baby onto the mother uh, as quickly as possible why is that yeah well nowadays so so back back in the day we used to clamp the cord as quick and cut it as quickly as possible there was actually a fear that the colostrum which is the early um pre-milk highly protonaceous liquid that comes out of the nipples, you know, yeah. as the, the breasts are starting to be prepared, colostrum is very, very rich in a variety of nutrients, very fatty and very high in protein. But back before we knew what was in it, we thought it was dangerous because it wasn't milk. 
So we would actually take the the baby away from the mother and allow the expression of all that colostrum before we would give the baby back. Now, I don't know how long ago that was, right. probably about a hundred years ago. Now, of course, we know better. And uh, fortunately, all the like, you know, old stuffy white guys at Ox in you know, Harvard and, and, and uh, you know, and all these big mm -hmm. schools have said, have declared breastfeeding is good for babies. Like, thank you. Thank you. A, a, you know, ruling elite. Um, but obviously, obviously for nine and a half months, this baby is sitting right in front of the mother's aorta and around her intestines, hearing the gurgling, hearing that, <laughs> hearing our voices, mom and dad's voices, probably muffled, can't really see much. There might be some light on the other side of the abdominal mm -hmm. wall, but the thick, you know, the layer of the uterus as well, there's this rich amniotic universe and the baby emerges though with birth and is now in a very foreign place. But the one thing the baby's gonna recognize is the mother's voice, perhaps even smell and taste. And of course, mother's oxytocin has been chemically addicting her mm -hmm. to her baby and vice versa. So in the conventional model, we would clip, we'd clamp, we, we'd get the baby dried off, wrap them up like a burrito, put a cap on their head. And by the way, that's where a lot of pheromones were released from the scalp, the scalp of a baby. That's why we so smell that's actually, them. That's why we smell yeah, babies. Okay. It, like that's my baby. This baby's like, like it helps just drive that, that sort of protective nature of the mother and the baby and the father and the, and the baby and the father of the mother. Like this is a, the transformation has happened. The portal is closing and this baby is desperate to connect with this person. Mm -hmm. um, if you shoot a, an, a sharp needle in the foot, if you put eye goop on their eyes, you're kind of disrupting that whole process. Not to mention you've stripped the baby away from the mother and you haven't brought her back to put her on her chest. Mm -hmm. Babies don't need wrapped up. They don't need the little hats. They need to be on their mother's chest. Yeah. And once they start, they get there, they, they have this reflex where they start kind of crawling around looking for a nipple. Like it's just awesome. So why disrupt that? Why mess with that? Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. I didn't I didn't know that there's been a change in the way we sort of researched. I guess the research led that change where whereas yeah. more traditionally it's it's obvious. <laughs> Uh, we get, yeah, it's, yeah, I mean, it's like obvious this baby needs milk. Where are they going to get milk? Let's put them on her chest, right? Yeah. But, you know, as we tried to, our war against nature has been persisting for several hundred years, at least since, since Rene Descartes, Francis Bacon. And that's just another reflection. It's like, we're going to keep doing it this ass backwards way until somebody demonstrates that it's, it's a good thing to breastfeed. Yeah. You know, we're going to do formula and all this stuff until somebody proves it. Well, I feel like it, that's so backwards. It should be incumbent on the person who wants to deviate from nature mm -hmm. to demonstrate without a doubt through their data and their research that it's actually better for us to go this way versus the way nature intended it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think they did that spoof research on whether parachutes uh, can save lives or not. Absolutely. I know that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got to look into the methodologies a little better before you draw conclusions. Exactly. That's for sure. you can, you, until someone tests it. <laughs> Um, have you told that, have you talked about that journal on your show? No, no, I should do that. Tell, tell it. Cause that's a really, it's a beautiful, like very, very genius level, yeah. uh, publication. Mm -hmm. I will do that. Uh, okay. So <laughs> I, I want to get now into this, yeah, the postpartum bit. So we've got this, this bonding that happens, uh, but the, a lot of women take a long time to recover. And it's been my observation that age can have something to do with that. The, the younger the, the lady is when she gives birth it's a shorter recovery, the older it can take longer. Is that, is that true? Is that something you've noticed? I think it's far more dependent on how a person takes care of themselves right. and how their experience happened. You know, on the one hand, yes, all the diet and everything is so critical. Mm -hmm. um, not being diabetic, uh, not having a C-section, you're going to have a far faster recovery. Mm -hmm. But if you'll also are, you know, I know you do a lot of sort of kinesiology, mm -hmm. you, you do a lot of postural awareness and in, in, in your movement coaching. Yeah training the low, you know, the, the training, the spine wrote, you know, keeping the spine mobile, keeping the hips mobile. A lot of those practices are going to lead to a very, very easy postpartum period. Not to mention, by the way, that exercise is also demonstrated to, to decrease the likelihood of postpartum blues and depression. Mm -hmm. But, but even more so than that, um, birth is stressful, as we mentioned, unintegrated stress leads to stress leads to trauma. So a lot of women who do have really, really challenging experiences in the hospital are not going to feel energetically intact afterwards. Yeah. In fact, the whole process of ritual and ceremony, we have to close that loop somehow. And that's what I think is actually lacking in our conventional model. You know, if you have a 
home birth, your midwife's going to be there with you every day for, you know, however many days afterwards that you need them. There's a resting and digesting period. There's a repletion period as opposed to the hospital where that like constant barrage of questions and interruptions, and it, it, it continues and persists through the first day or two that you're in the hospital. And then you're going home and you're like, what the hell was that all about? You know, it's no wonder women are like, that was not what I was expecting. No. Um, I think all of that, you know, the immeasurable parts, the mental, emotional, and spiritual gravity of being interrupted and disturbed in such a way also can contribute to poor postpartum recovery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I see your point. I think maybe I was looking at it incorrectly. I was looking at it that when a, an, um, a, an older lady who's giving birth, they might be treated slightly differently because of their age, end up having more interventions and then have a harder recovery because yeah. of the interventions. It's nothing to necessarily to do with, um, with their age. It's just, that's the way yeah. that, you know, they, they, what is it over 40 is called a geriatric birth or something. Um, in the States it's over 35, uh, but I'll tell you, I've had 37 year olds who are way healthier yes. and have much easier births than a 25 year old who's eating Burger King and, and Coca-Cola every day. Yeah. So again, it's no shame. It's no blame. It's just, you know, whatever you put in, you're going to kind of get a product mm -hmm. thereafter. Um, yeah. people who take care of themselves, doesn't matter their age. They can generally have a very, very easy birth experience and postpartum experience. Is there an upper limit? Do you think, um, I think Janet Jackson was pregnant or had gave birth or something recently. <laughs> yeah. The oldest woman that I've attended to that had a very, uh, hmm, man, they got pretty old in residency. Some of them had, had, had IVF and they right. were 54, 55. There was one lady, I think it was six, 57. And she had a terrible journey. Like it ended up being a really catastrophic ending. Oh. But um, I would say if your body is able to get pregnant naturally, yeah. then you're fit to have a baby. Wow. Interesting. Wow. Whether or not that plays out for people, I, I don't know. But I would say if your body is still putting resources towards uh, your reproduction, yeah. You probably have a pretty decent yeah. chance. You know, your hormonal systems are still mm -hmm. intact. You've got no, no major nutrient deficiencies. Mm -hmm. Your thyroid's working well. Mm -hmm. Your gut's working well. You got pregnant naturally. Mm -hmm. Your body can probably handle mm -hmm. it. You probably can, it just may not be as easy maybe as when you were 20. Yeah. Well, from an evolutionary point of view, that makes sense. Like, the, yeah, you know, we, yeah, we don't, the, the human body doesn't waste resources and things that it doesn't need. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Fascinating. Okay, Nathan, how can people find out a bit more about you and, and learn about these, how you support people and the courses that you offer? Yeah, so thank you, Ed, again, for having me. Um, if you guys are listening and you need to connect with me, I do work with people completely remotely all around the world. I only attend births if they're within driving distance, unless somebody flies me out to California for a whole month to wait for the baby. You just don't know when babies are going to happen. But for my fertility support, my pregnancy, postpartum support, all of that is remote. Um, you can find it at belovedholistics.com. And then, of course, I, I just am launching, um, gosh, in a matter of days, the doors open for a course called The Born Free Method, which is the most comprehensive and um, the most the most comprehensive pregnancy and postpartum educational program. It's an eight-week course, self-guided, lifetime access. All updates forever and ever are included in your purchase. But um, it also includes 12 months of weekly calls with me and Sarah Rosser, who's one of uh, the farm midwives. Ina May, you mentioned yep, her earlier, yep. one of the farm midwives down in Tennessee. And um, it, it, it's a perfect blend between the hard data and a truly spiritual way of looking at this this experience. There's a whole unit on cannabis and psychedelic use. There's a in pregnancy. There's a whole unit for dads. There's a whole unit on the history of midwifery and obstetrics. So, um, with plenty plenty of exercises and um, and lessons and modules on the risks, benefits, alternatives to virtually every intervention under the sun. So that is called the Born Free Method. You can go to bornfreemethod.com. And otherwise, I'm on Instagram at Nathan mm -hmm. Riley OBGYN, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, with that Born Free Free Method, is it a start date uh, and then the eight week course? Will people be able to join at any time? You, we are, we're enrolling the first two groups right now, okay. but you, as of June 1st, you'll be able to enroll whenever you feel compelled. Um, of course, right now, depending on when this episode comes out, at least if you, if you jump, um, really the wait list is going to be closing. We have like 400 people waiting to get into the course, but, uh, we are currently offering it at the wait list pricing. The full price will be available June 1st and anybody can join at any time. And like I said, once you join, once you pay for the course, 
the the program, you're getting those 12 months of weekly calls. But that course, it, even though I say it takes eight weeks, you could you could invest 10 years mm-hmm. reading everything, all the 250 plus citations. You could take the course over and over and over again. You may be even considering getting pregnant next year. Like I said, let's start dialing in your health now. Mm-hmm. All of the lifestyle medicine, everything that I do is included in one course. So, um, yeah, born free method is, I think it's a game changer. I think it's going to change. That that sounds absolutely fantastic. I wish I had that resource when I was having uh, my kids. as Me too. (laughs) I made it for me. (laughs) I made it for me and and my wife. (laughs) Exactly. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Nathan. that was a lot of fun. It's my pleasure, Ed. Thanks again. That was cool. Thank you for joining me in my conversation with Nathan Riley. If you've enjoyed listening to and learning from this podcast, please leave a comment or suggestion for a future podcast guest that you would like us to feature. In addition, on Apple, you can leave us up to a five-star review and you can leave us a comment. Now, if you want my direct help with anything to do with lifestyle medicine, you can send me an email at ed at edpaget or visit my website edpaget.com. And last, but certainly not least, thank you for your interest in lifestyle medicine.